You know, the great burden of the Christian life um, is time. It's time. And what do I mean by that? So much has been laid before, our, laid before us that how do you get to it all? You know, so many people have such a wrong understanding that the Christian life is something that's a part of your life. But Jesus is not the course in the meal. He's the meal. And a thousand lifetimes on this planet would not give you enough time to sound the depths of an adequate prayer life. Or to exhaust the blessings of God. A thousand years of simply studying one passage of Scripture would not be long enough to sound the depths of that passage of Scripture. It would be impossible. I was driving here this morning and there was a song on the radio that um, it really, I guess if you looked at it as um, with regard to art, it was not that great of song. But it had a message that was absolutely unbelievable. And it was this, you've not even begun to fathom even the, the smallest part of what I have for you. And although we recognize the sovereignty of God, we also recognize His interaction with man in that we have not even begun to avail ourselves, not even begun to avail ourselves of all that He has for us. And I sat there in my car as I was coming here and I was thinking to myself, Lord, what do I do? If I dedicated myself 16 hours a day to prayer, I would not be able to out-ask His grace. I would not be able to obtain all that was there for me and all that was there for His kingdom. If I were to dedicate myself to 16 hours a day uh, to Bible study, I would still, after the end of my life, I would be a baby. Now that's encouraging. That is encouraging. It's like there's a man who frets because he doesn't have enough money to spend, and there's a man who frets because he cannot spend all his money. I would rather be the latter. And that's what we have in Christianity. Now... That's why Peter and others are always talking about stirring up the believer. Because we sit there so apathetic. Rather watch the Discovery Channel or just sit in our office or behind our desk or on the couch and read through a passage and not even remember what we read. We must be stirred up. And that is part of the purpose of the church. For iron to sharpen iron. To stir one another up. To encourage one another. To go on. To go on. It was uh, always amazing to me there in in Latin America, especially among the... um, Well, uniquely, actually. Uniquely among the uh, mountain men of northern Peru. If you asked one of them... As a Christian, if you asked him, ¿Cómo estás? How are you doing? He would say, avanzando, hermano, avanzando. He would say, advancing, brother, advancing. We we hear C.S. Lewis talk about going further in and further up into the things of God. Are you advancing? Now I want to warn you about something. You only have one life to live. Only one. Not two, not three. One. Beware of those who would rob you of life. You see, the system in which you have been born is so powerful, you have no idea. 
I have no idea how much it grabs a hold of us. A young guy uh, is born into this world. His dad assumes certain things about him. Well, he must play sports. He must do this. He needs to go to uh, uh, grade school. He needs to make good grades. He, in high school, well, he needs to be popular. He needs to get ready for college. He needs to go to college. He must go to college. You can't be anything if you don't go to college. And then from there, you go to college to get a good job. And well, you get this really good job, which consumes most of your life, but you're able to have a few hours off on weekends, but of course you can supplement your life with this great job of yours by buying all kinds of things you don't need and in the end you die. If you are anything, if you are anything, you are a relational being. Never forget that had a Greek professor one time that we were going through the Sermon on the Mount in Greek and he said, if the Sermon on the Mount's about anything, it's about relationships. You are a relational being. Yet the world in which you are born does not want that. It wants to make you a mechanical thing. Now one of the things that... Uh, my wife and I quite frequently discuss is the difference between um, eating to live and living to eat. Most people live to eat. And it ruins them. It kills them. It, it kills them in, in more ways than they could ever know. Live to eat. Rather than only eat to live, to make the quality of your life higher. Most people, instead of working in order, working enough to live, they live to work. And for what reason? Let's face it. There are times and there are circumstances where men must work and they must work hard, and they must work 18 hours a day to provide for their family. That is true. But in our culture, many times, such a work ethic is not forced upon us. It's something we decide to do. And in doing that, we have stopped being a living creature. We've become an, an, a machine. Someone living without any purpose whatsoever. We always hear of the reward of it. The reward of it. But in our society in the West, the reward of it, things. Things. That, that things are esteemed over relationships. Over a relationship with God, over a relationship with a wife, a spouse, over a relationship with children, over a relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ, over a relationship with anyone else. Things are esteemed. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane. There's a... Um, Kind of a joke in Peru talks about two Peruvians. Um, most of you may know that one of the richest fishing banks in the world is right off the coast of Peru. And um, an American businessman comes down to Lima and he goes out by the ocean and he sees two Peruvian fishermen. And they're in a little wooden boat and they're both kind of laid back. Um, They've got their lines out. They've got their hats pulled down over their eyes to block the sun and they're laying back in the boat. And the businessman walks over there and he calls to them and he says, what are you doing? And they said, well, what do you mean? Well, you're, you're sitting upon one of the world's richest fishing banks. Y yes. Well, you're just... You're just laying there with your resting, with your hat pulled down over your face and your lines out. And you, well, what should we do? 
Well, you need to get going. Catch more fish. Well, why? Well, then you make more money. Well, why do we need to do that? Well, because then you can buy uh, more boats, get people working for you. Well, why should we do that? Well, then you can keep prospering and prospering. And then what? And then you can just sit back and relax. And they said, well, that's what we're doing now. Now, you know the way that I have taught about a work ethic, how we should expend ourselves, how we should work. But I have to be very careful. I realize this, that when I say that, it's automatically going to be filtered through a certain context. You assume that I mean work really hard at a job Work a long time at a job. Work long hours at your job. Work. That's not what I mean. At least not anymore. Now, one of the deadly sins of Christian history is slothfulness. Did you know that? Right up there, gluttony is one of the seven deadly sins. Lust. Slothfulness. Slothfulness. You may be guilty of that. I know you are. Because I know even I am. Now, you see, slothfulness, we think, in our American context, would mean that uh, you're not working hard to prosper. Slothfulness in the Christian context is you are not living for God and living for God's kingdom in full strength. You're not exerting yourself to the fullness of your abilities and the strength God gives you for His glory, for His honor, for the promotion of His kingdom. Slothfulness. You've finished your work. You've come home from the office. And you know your wife has certain needs. But you're tired. Slothfulness. You know your children have many specific requirements. But you'd rather do something else. Slothfulness. I want you to look at slothfulness not in the terms of a money-making enterprise. I want you to look at slothfulness in terms of not serving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and not giving yourself as a servant to those closest around you. That's what I want to talk about. You see. What does it mean to carry your cross? Well, it can mean almost countless things. But here's something I want you to think about. I know men, I think of one man in particular right now who's in Florida who was offered in his profession a position in which he would earn two to three times more money than he was presently earning. Now, in the American mindset, what should he do? Well, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Man, he should go. Bam! Go up there. Take the job. He turned it down. And because he turned it down, he drives used cars. Because he turned it down, he lives in just a modern kind of suburban dwelling. Because he turned it down... He buys at uh, Target and Jacques Panay and um, Walmart. But he turned it down so that he could serve his God, serve his family, serve his children, serve his wife, serve friends. Don't allow yourself to be sucked into that vortex. 
Now, I'm not talking about lazy. Maybe some of you are lazy. And you need a swift kick in the pants because you are lazy. I'm not talking about being lazy, but I'm talking about if you're going to expend energy, do it for the right things. Don't do it for a certain label on a shirt. Don't do it for a certain place to live. Don't. Simplicity. To get everything out of your life that really does not lead to service to God, devotion to God, and service to one another. Get it out of your life. It's just not necessary. How many of you have ever bought something that the moment you bought it and took it home, you were sick that you had bought it? You knew you had become a slave to it. That if you kept it, it was bondage. And so you turn around after some sense came into your head and you sell it. And you actually lost money when you sold it, but you were so glad to be rid of that thing. That's bondage. How many of you have ever bought anything that was not pretty, did not shine, was not new, but it brought no bondage into your life? And even though no one gawked when you drove it down the road, well, they may have gawked, but not for the right reasons. but you were free. You were happy. In our materialistic Western world, the key is to work hard for the right things. For the right things. And they're not things at all. They're personal. God and people. Albert Schweitzer, who was brilliant, absolutely brilliant man. Now, he was liberal in his theology. Um, It's hard to explain a man like that. Very liberal to the point of not in the stream of historical Christianity. But he spent the first 30 years of his life, this, is, this was his plan, I will spend the first 30 years of my life preparing so that I can give the next 30 years of my life away in service. And that's what he did. He was a brilliant, I would call him more philosopher than theologian, He was, I think it was either a concert pianist or a concert organist. He was a medical doctor. And he wasted his life, some would say, threw it away in Africa. Spent himself completely. He spoke at a uh, seminary gathering in his later years, and he looked at all the young men and he said this, I do not know what you will become, but I do know that the happiest among you will be the one who gives his life away in service to others. Jesus. You see... So, you know, these are things. I was listening to a preacher this morning also, just kind of... I think it was David Jeremiah. It sounded like his voice. It may have been someone else. I don't want to directly quote him. But um, he said that some some theologians, I don't know how theological they are, some theologians say that Matthew 5-7... through The Sermon on the Mount is actually not for us today. It's not for the Christian. That's a hyper-dispensational argument that he was teaching 
the ethic to Jews. It has nothing to do with the church age or Christianity, which if there was ever a misinterpretation in the entire universe, that is it. It is the Christian manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount. But he said, I think that some people arrive at that opinion not for theological reasons, but out of fear. Have you ever looked at that thing? It's dangerous. That is, of course, unless you explain it away, and we are pretty good at explaining things away, aren't we? It's dangerous. Isn't it amazing that in all this reform that's going on, all these people rediscovering historical theology and historical Christianity and the the Reformation and everything else that we sure talk a lot about the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians, but we don't talk a whole lot about the Sermon on the Mount. Because with the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians, at least up until chapter 12 in Romans and up till chapter 4 in Ephesians, you can just use those truths to pontificate, to debate, to show everyone how clever you are exegetically. But the Sermon on the Mount, it's not about how smart you are. It's about taking up your cross and following a Master whose way of life is a complete and total contradiction of everything the world will tell you to do. Maybe you've heard this story before. I had a, uh, a guy who was kind of discipling me when I first became a believer at the University of Texas. And it just so happened we were both at different hours, but we both had the same psych professor. And uh, immediately, even though I was a new Christian, I recognized this guy is, if he's not the Antichrist, he's his cousin. <laughs> he would stand up on the platform, huge auditorium, and mock God. He would dare the students to record him and then play him backwards to get satanic messages. He made fun of everything sacred. He was a beast when it came to spirituality. He railed against authorities and powers. He, he was a horrid man. And you could tell he was miserable. One day, my, my friend... Mike, he had the class right before me. And he came out of the class. I'm kind of walking towards the building. He's got the biggest smile on his face. He said, oh, I love that class. I go, what? What class? The psych class. I love that class. I am learning how to live based on everything I'm hearing in that class. And I'm like, new believer. And I'm going, but Mike, you told me that that guy, you know, he goes, yes. Listen to everything he says. Do just the opposite and you'll have the Scriptures. And that's, that's true. Now, the problem. The problem is when the church and her ministers have a prophetic voice but only theologically when the prophetic voice is only prophetic theologically and not ethically, there's your problem. There is a theological lackadaisicalness, a theological apathy But the greater apathy is with regard to living out this stuff. When I look at believers, sincere believers in Jesus Christ, you know, sometimes I'll see a guy walking into walls and everything else and walk up to him and say, you know, what are you, what's going on? Man, man, Romans 7. I just can't figure out, is it a believer or an unbeliever? You sometimes you see someone wrestling like that, or when I'm working on something all day and at the end I realize I went in the wrong direction. It's frustrating. But that's not what I normally see among believers. 
I don't see them struggling with great truths that's painted such concern on their face. I see them struggling with the inability to live out the ethical teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles. I don't see anyone that comes up to me and goes, look, I'm really not understanding Ephesians 5 and its commands with regard to my responsibility to my wife. But I see them saying, I can't live this. I'm not living this. So you, 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 you don't just want to have a theological voice. You want to have an ethical voice. Now, another thing that is extremely important. I know we're rambling, but all these things are things that I just want to touch on. I'm not going to be here now for a couple of weeks. I have to go preach. There is a theological vagueness. Do you realize that? Mission organizations are experts at this. Why? They, they're creed or their confession of faith, they reduce it down and make it so general so that they might take in as many supporters as possible. When you start defining things theologically in your mission statement and saying this is what we believe as opposed to this, then you're going to have a lot of people say, I'm not supporting your mission organization because you believe this and I don't. But if you're all about just the very basics, then you can draw from a wider range of people. So there's a theological vagueness out there and it's very dangerous. But those of us who pride ourselves on the specificity of our theology, those of us who take to heart that we do not want to be vague but specific in the great doctrines of Christianity, do we, with our ethic, turn right around and commit the same error? Not of a theological vagueness, but an ethical vagueness. Well, that's just a, a matter of conscience. Well, that's just the way you see it. Isn't it amazing? You get in a theological debate and people will say to you, well, that's just the way you see it. They won't talk grammar. They won't talk context. They won't search church history. They just go, that, well, that's your, you know, that's your opinion. That's the way you see the text. That's not the way I see the text. That's a theological vagueness. Very dangerous. Uh, relativism, actually, is what it is. Those of us who hate that, do we do the same thing when it comes to ethics? An ethical vagueness. And if someone gets real specific in theology, those who prefer to have a vague theology say, you're just splitting hairs. But in a world of ethical vagueness and a Christianity that is very vague in its ethic, when someone starts getting specific, everyone looks at him and says, you're a legalist. Now, there are men who split hairs. A dead scholasticism, theologically, with regard to how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And there are legalists. But just because there are scholastics who try to search out things in Scripture that are not there, and just because there are legalists, does not mean that we have the right to be vague in our theology or vague in our ethic. So the thing here is not just to know but to do. Not just to have conformed thinking, but conformed action. Conformed action. And that is going to require 
a great deal of effort. If you begin, this is this is the sad part. If you begin to seek to live like Jesus, who's going to cause you problems? I'll tell you who's going to cause you problems. Christians will cause you more problems than the unbelieving world. It'll be the Christian who will rail upon you and not so much the unbeliever. The unbeliever might say, well, there, at, least goes someone, at least there goes someone who's trying to live this stuff out. But it'll be from within that the attack comes. Legalist, super spiritual, so on and so forth. Why? Because your life will convict. Your own life will expose. Your own life will be a light shining in the darkness. It's like a man who works in the factory. And uh, let's say he's not a very bold witness. He doesn't jump up on the uh, t dinner table there at the factory luncheon and preach the gospel. He's not a very bold witness, but he just goes off with his lunch pail, sits way over in the corner by himself, and starts to pray over his meal. I guarantee you there'll be factory workers that see him and they rail on him, make fun of him, call him all sorts of things. He hasn't even spoken to these people. So why are they doing this? Because his righteous actions convict them of their unrighteous actions. Well, let's pray and uh, we'll uh, get ready for our study. Yes. Regarding the ethic when people are ethically precise and yet theologically you seem to do that you just don't seem to have a hand on that God honors that. I know that there are certain truths in part of God that God's not going to compromise in any circumstance, but how is it that God seems to overlook their doctrinal compromises in areas to still bless that God and use His ministry? That's very, very true. I have known men who I would strongly disagree with in certain areas of theology. Leonard Ravenhill, for one. Yet God's hand was so upon that man. So upon that man. To know and to, to, to have God use him in a way that I wouldn't even begin to understand. There, uh, probably an urban legend as it goes, but a story about a, a missionary who was in Africa and he gets up and he's teaching and there's a young man in the front pew and as he's teaching, he gets through his first principle that he's teaching and the young African jumps up and runs out of the church. Thought that was kind of unusual. Then the next night, the young man's sitting back there again on the front pew and, um, and the pastor gets through with his first principle, first truth, first command that he's going through in that particular passage, and the young man jumps up, runs out of the church. Third night, same thing. Fourth night, same thing. Towards the end of the meetings, the pastor finally stopped him. He said, young man, what are you doing? And he said, sir, well, I just imagine that when I hear something, that I'm not doing, that I'm not practicing, that is commanded in Scripture, I don't need to listen to anything else. I just need to get up, go out, and practice it. And uh, God honors that. God honors that. 
Now, with an ethic, let me say this, what's dangerous about an ethic? And, and when I mean ethics, it seems to me today when someone writes a book on ethics, it's all about Christianity and government, abortion, uh, masculine, feminine, gender, all these different things. When I'm talking about an ethic, I'm talking about what does the Bible say about what you're supposed to wear, how you're supposed to talk what you should behold with your eyes. Mine's a bit less developed, I guess. One of the dangerous things about an ethic is this. There are many times, for example, with clothing, where specific principles are not laid out for you. But there are principles so here's what you have to do. You have to take the principles of Scripture and from that draw inferences, draw conclusions, and then live according to that. Now, here's something very, 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 very important. There is a difference between following a specific command in Scripture and following your inference. A specific command of Scripture, uh, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's not an inference. Don't lie about your neighbor. Very specific. You see? You don't need to sit down and try to draw inferences or exactly what does he mean here or how does this work with another text that says a certain thing. You don't have to do that. You've just got the principle right there. Don't lie about your neighbor. But when it comes to clothing, you have this text and this text and this text. It doesn't say a woman shouldn't wear pants. It doesn't say how long sleeves should be. It doesn't say all these things, but it does give us principles on modesty, decency, not causing someone to stumble. And so we have to take those and draw from it. That's where the problem starts. Is when a person takes their inferences and gives them the same authority as direct commands of Scripture. Do you see? Alright, well let's pray. Father, we come before You in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we praise You and thank You for Your covenant faithfulness that Your mercies are new every morning. Because, oh God, we need them. We have not been destroyed because You do not change. Our salvation is sure because it rests upon the virtue and the merits of Christ. Father, we just simply want to remind ourselves in prayer, we want to acknowledge before Your throne that it is all of grace that we have cast ourselves upon the living hope, that we have an anchor within the veil, that our standing before You is wrapped up in one person, one impeccable, infallible person, Your Son, Jesus Christ. So we ask You, Lord, lead us on, O King Eternal. Guide us by the Holy Spirit Guide us through Your Word. You have been our helper in all times past. Be our helper today. In Jesus' name, Amen.
God is so good. He is so good. You know, I, I wish that literally I could take all my mistakes and put them in a book and make them an object lesson to you. I think I could teach you more from the mistakes I've made than anything else. It would definitely be a, a two-volume set. Um, look, you are not going to become what you ought to become in a day. You are not going to become what you ought to become in a year. You are not going to understand Scripture as you should understand Scripture after ten hours of Bible study. This is a lifelong thing. Don't waste your life in this area. Dedicate. Set out. Write it down. Make it a law in your life. Read the Scriptures an hour a day. Read systematically. Start in Genesis. Go through the entire Bible systematically. Then do it again and again and again. Write down all your questions in a notebook. Seek to answer those questions in certain parts of Scripture with other parts of Scripture and make it a lifelong practice. Tarry with the Lord Jesus Christ every day for a certain amount of time. And then do all that so that you might walk the rest of the day loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself and forget about all the other peripheral things that really don't matter a hill of beans. Okay, let's go to John. Chapter 1. Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Now, what we're going to be doing is, let me, let me read this, this part to you. You know, we've gone through Proverbs 8, learned a lot there. We discovered that the Son was not only the agent of creation, but that He was the consummate delight of His Father. We're looking at the state and status of Jesus Christ prior to the Incarnation. Now, why are we doing that? You cannot appreciate the Incarnation unless you appreciate His state and status prior to the Incarnation. You cannot understand how low He came if you do not understand how high He was. To say that I became incarnate is absolutely meaningless because I am incarnate. I've always been incarnate. It's a privilege for me to be incarnate, to be in flesh, to be alive, to breathe. For the Son of God, who dwelled in inexpressible and unapproachable light, who was that light, the delight of His Father throughout all of eternity past, is quite another thing for Him to take on flesh. So we see in the following passages from the Gospel of John, we will see something of the same. The Son of God prior to His incarnation. That the Son not only shared His Father's glory, but that He was the Father's beloved in ways and degrees that go infinitely beyond all creaturely comprehension. This endearment may be the greatest proof and manifestation of the Son's glory. Now, I know that's just kind of an introduction, but let's touch on that for a moment. Maybe the greatest way to express the Son's pre-incarnate glory is to endeavor to understand, first of all, the love the Father had toward Him. After all, it's the love of God God's disposition toward a certain person or thing 
that most manifest their value. Wouldn't you agree? How does God esteem them? So we can talk about Christ's relationship to angels. We can talk about the extensive nature of His throne, His sovereignty, and everything else. But all of that are small hill. All of those things are small hills compared to this mountain. The Father delighted in Him. The Father gave to Him utmost value. He was the Father's delight. Now, do we need to know anything else now? That in itself expresses to us how great was the Son of God prior to His incarnation. Now, it says He was the beloved of the Father. Here we see, I want us to, uh, to look. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained him. Now you say, well, Brother Paul doesn't say beloved of the Father. Yeah, but he's in his bosom. I don't know how you could be any more beloved than that. Let's look at the text. Only begotten God. Now I want us to look at this for a moment. Please understand I'm not denying historical Christianity here, but I want us to look at something that's very important, and that's this terminology of the only begotten God, because it has caused a great deal of problems throughout historical Christianity. Now, the enemies of the Gospel have often argued that if the Son is begotten, there must be a time when He was not. Therefore, He must be inferior to the Father. You see that? Even my son brought this up last night. Not Ian, my five-year-old, Evan. He said, Dad, was Jesus born... Yes, well then if He was born, He's not forever. Okay? Do you get the problem here? Now, this is not the intention of the text. The purpose of the text is not to tell us that there was a time when the Son was not. Because there, according to Scripture, there was never a time when the Son was not. Let's look at what it's saying. John has already told us in no uncertain terms that the Son was and is God. The phrase only begotten is derived from the Greek word that denotes something of a unique kind or the only example in its category. Now, it's translated in many, many texts, I believe, incorrectly. They're not understanding the Greek term doesn't mean necessarily only begotten, but it describes the uniqueness of the Son of God, that He is unique and there is no other like Him. The word only distantly relates to the idea of being begotten. Only very, very distantly. Yet that has been put at the forefront throughout many centuries of Christianity. In the Greek... The idea is not primarily begottenness. The idea is uniqueness, separateness. That He is unlike any other being that may be referred to as Son. He is the unique Son. Now, in referring to the Son as the only begotten, John is simply making reference to the unique and wonderful relationship that has always existed between the first and second persons of the Trinity, that of the Father and Son. As there has always been a Father, there has always been a Son who is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of His nature. Being God, the Son is uniquely qualified to reveal or explain Him. So, What I want you to see in this, this idea of only begotten, does not mean that there was a time when the Son did not exist, that there was a time that He came into being. It also doesn't give... uh, It is not making reference to the idea of some eternal generation of the Son which was a common uh, doctrine among many. But the idea is simply 
uniqueness. He is the unique Son of God. This is very important because we know that angels are at times referred to as sons of God. We know that kings uh, bear that title. But here we have the one unique Son of God. Now it says here, and this is our main point, who is in the bosom of the Father. These words are descriptive of the intimate relationship that has always existed between the Father and the Son. He has always been the beloved of the Father and the most privy to His counsel. There is nothing, or let me put it this way, Christ has been, the Son of God, has never been shut out of any counsel with the Father. There is not one part. You know, we always say, you know, God has my heart. He has part of my heart. There are chambers in my heart God has not entered. There are aspects of my life where He does not reign. We say also with regard to intimate relationships, there are people who know me better than others. I reveal myself to certain people more than I do others. That's what close friendship is all about. Well, there is there's no aspect of the Father unrevealed to the Son. There is no closed door of revelation. There is no closed door of counsel. There is complete openness oneness, unity, togetherness, nothing of being shut out. You see, there is so much about God that you do not know. So much about God that I do not know. So many of His decrees that are secret to us. So many areas in which we're actually told, don't go there. At least not at this time. That is not the case with the Son. Do you understand that? There is no... That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, John Gill writes, the phrase denotes unity of nature and essence in the Father and Son. Their distinct personality, strong love and affection between them, the Son's acquaintance with His Father's secrets. I think it's also amazing that even though this is speaking about the unity between the Father and the Son, it also manifests something very important. They're distinctive. That they are distinctive. They are two unique individuals. Distinct individuals. There is a Father. There is a Son. They are not the same person. But they are of same essence. Now you say, why is this, why is this important? Well, because it's part of our understanding of the Trinity. But there's another reason. In Peru, as well as many other third world countries, and here in the United States, some very popular preachers believe in what they call the oneness doctrine that uh, the Trinity does not exist. But there is a modalism that there are... There is one God and one person who manifests Himself in three separate modes. At times, He is the Father. At times, He is the Son. And at times, He is the Spirit. Now, I always love to ask them about the baptism of Jesus and how they work themselves around that. Did... uh, Did the Father manifest Himself as the Son on earth and then jump back up into heaven to speak down at Him and say, this is My beloved Son, and then do something in between the both by coming down and resting upon Him in the form of the Holy Spirit? There are three specific persons. There's one very popular preacher who's even spoke for the Southern Baptists or certain Southern Baptist churches. I won't say for the Southern Baptists but in certain Southern Baptist churches who believes this. Written many, many books. This is heresy of the worst kind. There is one God, three persons, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. Three distinct persons. Now, I want you to think about this. The honor of being brought in to someone's counsel. For example, if I said, um, you know, Shannon, do you want to go to lunch today? He says, no, uh, the president called and, and wants me to uh, come meet with him at Camp David, some things to discuss. I mean, you just don't say that and then walk out the door. Everybody's like, what? Wait, hold, stop. What do you mean? And then from then on, all around Muscle Shoals, when Shannon goes to Walmart or Fred's, people say, there's the guy that went to Camp David. You see, something happened. There's an esteem there, a respect. He was brought into the council of the most powerful man in the country. He took counsel with him. He was brought into the secret chamber. He discussed things that, that he can't even tell us. And he enjoys telling us that he can't tell us. <laughs> but you see, Christ dwelled in the bosom of the Father and in His secret counsels. Now this is most amazing when you think about this Son of God, eternal Son of God, that dwelt in the bosom of the Father, has made Himself our brother, has taken flesh upon Himself. He has become one of our kind. And one of the specific reasons for that is not only to provide redemption, but also to provide revelation. To exegete God for us. To explain to us who is God and reveal God's counsels to us. Now, Matthew Poole writes, He who is the only begotten and beloved Son hath such an intimate communion with Him in His nature and such a free communication of all His counsels as it may be said, He is continually in His bosom. I think also we need to understand here, and I didn't really go into it, but it's important that present tense just is in the counsel, in the bosom of the Father. Never a time when the door is closed to Him. Now, Matthew Henry writes, He had lain in His bosom from eternity, in the bosom of His special love, dear to Him, in whom He was well pleased, always His delight, one in nature and essence, and therefore in the highest degree, one in love. This is what makes the cross and the forsakenness of the cross so amazing. That this one who was in the bosom of the Father would eventually cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I see, you and I were born going estranged from, from the going astray from the womb. You and I have lived in sin like a fish lives in water. As some would say, and I don't know how they know this, that a fish does not know he's wet. We at least do not know the extent of our common fellowship with sin. How common it is for us to be in sin. How common and usual it is for us to be estranged from God. But here is the Son of God who had never known estrangement, never known distance, always been the delight of His Father, always beheld His Father's face that when He's on the tree, he cries out, My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? Now, John Flavel writes, It is an expression of the greatest dearness and intimacy in the world. As if he should say, wrapped up in the very soul of his Father, embosomed in God. If you're a father, you can understand something of that. Very, very small, but something of that that you almost embosom your children. You almost wrap around them. 
Have you ever felt that you loved someone so much, your wife, your children, that you wanted to draw them to you? You wanted them not to be outside of you. You wanted to be one. You almost pull them to you so tight that you hope that somehow they will come into you. But the Father and the Son always had that. And it was not just a hope. It was not just a passing word or a thought. It was a reality. A reality. One of the things that's really neat, this just always happens to me whenever... The, the boys and Rowan, uh, you know, the boys now, praise God, give, them, give themselves a shower. But Rowan still needs a bath. And you give them a bath and then they get in those little pajamas with the stripes and the little feet on them. And you just want to hug them so much that you almost break them in two. You just sit there and have a Bible study in the bed or, or something like that and you feel that just... You see, I don't want you to look at God in this mechanical, decisional sort of way. And I I don't really know how to say it, but it's like sometimes... Now, when I, I read men like Dr. Piper and things like that, I don't get this. But when I hear men sometimes talk about what he's talking about, I'm going, I don't really think you're understanding what he's saying. Or Edwards, for that matter. And we talk about God's covenantal love. That His love is, is immutable. It does not change. And it's, it's based upon that covenant. That, that's all true. But you can say it in a wrong way so that it almost becomes, well, God made the agreement to love you and He's going to do it because He doesn't go back on His Word. And there's nothing there of desire or passion. God is not forced into loving you because of some covenant He made. He made the covenant because He loves you. He's happy of being consistent in that covenant. He really loves you. Sometimes there has been a desire to protect God in the sense of, well, we have to be very careful about speaking about attributing any sort of passion to God and this or that because then He uh, can be directed by something outside of Himself and carried on by passion and so on and so forth. Much of that is just diatribe. It's useless. God is a free being. He is not manipulated, motivated, influenced, led around by anything or anyone other than Himself. But He has freely entered into a relationship of love and He really, really loves you. He really longs for you. He really broods over you. He can really be grieved by you. He loves you. And this relationship with His Son is not just this cosmic, gigantic, omnipotent, omniscient relationship that existed between two persons. It was personal. It is personal. It's marked by love in its highest degree and in its fullness. John Flavel, to lie in the bosom is the posture of dearest love. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom He loved. John 13.23 It's a mark of intimacy and love. If I'm sitting down at a table and a woman walks in, or I'm sitting down at a pew and a woman walks in, sits down beside me whom I don't, that I don't know, she takes my hand and leans her head on my shoulder. I mean, I'm going to... It's like my son Evan says, Dad, that gives me the freaks. 
I mean, I'd jump out of that pew so fast you'd think that I'd caught on fire. Think, who is this person? Are they out of their cotton-picking mind? They're, they don't do this to me. You have to be invited into this. It's not something you just assume. You're, 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 you're clawing for an intimacy that doesn't belong to you. But that's not the case with the Father and the Son. But Christ did not lean upon the Father's bosom as that disciple did in His, but He lay in it. Remember what I said to you, you. You embrace your wife, your children. You think to yourself, they've got their head on your chest. You're holding them. But you're thinking to yourself, if you truly love them, this is not enough. They can't get them. I need them closer. That wasn't the case with the Father and the Son. He did not simply lay His head upon His bosom. He was in His bosom. Jonathan Edwards writes, Christ from eternity is, as it were, in the bosom of the Father as the object of His infinite complacence. In Him is the Father's eternal happiness. Now, do you want to talk about how great Jesus is? Okay, let's do it right here. In Him is the Father's eternal happiness. Said enough? <coughs> what else needs to be said? What greater statement can be made about a being, a person, that the Father's eternal happiness was wrapped up in Him. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, let's, uh, let's take a break for about five or ten minutes. Let's pray. Father, I, I rejoice. I praise You, Father, for everything that You are and everything that Your Son is to You and to us. We bless You in Jesus' name. Amen.